92, when we got married, we wanted a, a, a home and a marriage pleasing to God. We wanted to live by the biblical foundation that he had our marriage on. Uh, before we got married, when we tithed, went to church and tithed, we just gave what we felt like giving at times. You know, we give $5 here, $5, $10 out of our wallet. We didn't do the 10% that God commanded us to. That's one principle we, we prayed about when we got married, that we wanted to give the 10%. You know, we worked hard all week at our jobs. We both had career jobs. I worked a part-time job. And then uh, some weeks we struggled. We, we struggled with money, even making it to, the, to get to work that week with money. You know, we was like anybody else. We went paycheck to paycheck. And because of our past, we, we were deep in debt before we got married. And we brought that debt together in marriage. Most of it was mine. And it, it was hard for a young couple. We struggled with it. And we knew that we had to take care of this debt, but we, we just didn't know how. And we prayed about it and prayed about it. And we talked to God about it. And, you know, we just said, God, we, we got to get rid of this debt for us. So we set a goal to be debt free in two years. But we weren't sure how to do it. But God kept bringing us back to Mal Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the lords of heaven, armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. And that's what we did. We put God to the test. We said, God, we want to be debt free of this money. You know, it's, it's hurting our relationship. It's hurting our marriage. We're struggling. So God gave us the tools and resources. And we challenged God. We said, God, every time we pay off a debt, a credit card bill, or any kind of small debt, we're going to upper tithe another percent. And we kept going. And we kept paying debt off. We kept upping it. We kept upping it, you know, 11, 12 percent, 13 percent. And it's all glory to him because you know, if it wasn't for him giving us the tools and resources to do this, we could have never got out of debt. Within two years, we were out of debt. We were debt free of all that credit card bills, all of the stupid debt that we brought into the marriage. And I just give God all the glory. And we don't give to get. We give because that's what God commanded us to do. We love giving. We love giving our time, our resources, our money. It's our goal to keep giving as much as we can in life. You know, when God, when Jesus hung on that cross and died for us, died for me. It made it personal and I really need to, I want to give more. And that's where my wife looks at it. If we can just give more to keep one more soul out of hell, then it's worth every penny we give. And you can never outgive God. You're not going to outgive Him no matter what you do. And He'll throw blessings at you that you never knew existed. And we are Doug and Starla Riddick and this is our story. Amen. Thank you, Doug and Starla, for opening up your heart, and we're in week five of the uh, sermon series, This Is My Story. Over the last few weeks, we have uncovered and tapped into perhaps some of the most difficult topics, some even what we might consider taboo uh, in the context of the church. We've talked about suicide. We've talked about pornography addiction. We've talked about incarceration and how far is too far that God cannot redeem you and bring you back in. We even talked last week with George Dennehy. If you didn't see that, go check it out online. Any of these sermons are online now. Uh, with talking about disabilities. What, what do you do when God's called you to do something and you, you don't necessarily have the resources to do what he's called you to do? And, of course, I like the way George puts a little twist on it. He said he took it from disability to, hey, check out disability. You know, he's got the ability to play the piano and the, and the guitar with his feet. And it's just an amazing—and drive my truck, as you saw online, which was amazing um, in and of itself. But the, each unique storyteller is just that. It's unique to their own life, to what God has done and is doing in their life. But here's what I believe to be true and why this matters, is that our stories are not so different after all. That maybe we cannot sit here today and praise the Lord and say, hey, I've contemplated suicide this week. But I have the belief that at some point in time, we will come to face to face with some difficulty that is so much larger than our ability to deal with it. If you're there, say amen. To get to that place where you realize that you just need a touch from the Holy One of Israel, that we need a touch from God. Then maybe we haven't dealt with incarceration, but maybe we have all come to a place where we have to decide to do something morally or immorally, ethically or unethically, and in case it might even be an illegal thing, where we have to say, well, but do I cheat on my taxes to make it, or do I risk incarceration? Whatever it may be, and yet we have to make that decision of morality. That each one of these subjects, very sensitive, 
But I believe with all of my heart that there is another topic that could literally cross us over into a point of the fullness of God's blessings. And that's in the area of our giving. The Bible calls mammon. We talk about money. We talk about finances. We talk about tithing or offering. What, what are all those things really mean? Because here's what I've found to be true since we started this church, more so within the last year, is I've had more people call me and ask to meet with me about finances than they has about marriage. And marriage is, 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 is they're, they're, they're seemingly falling apart all over the place. Yet here's what I've found to be true. More people want to know and understand this principle of giving. Why is it that God God who owns everything needs my money. Why does the church want my money? We've even come to this place, and I admit that the church has done more damage in the context of money than the world will ever do. Because you have these preachers that are preaching, and I'll say this, and you'll never hear me call out another preacher. You'll even tell evangelists, even if I dogmatically, emphatically disagree with him, you'll never hear me call a person out. That's between them and the Lord. But I will say this without apology. Inside the church, I submit to you that we have done more damage in the area of giving because we have begun to preach, not we, but some of this idea of give to get. That if I give, then I'm going to get something in return. When in fact, here's what I believe to be true. I live under a mandate of I get to give. That it's truly a privilege for me, and I say me because, yes, I am a tither. I, I give sacrificially. In fact, this year, and I have no problem telling you this, I think transparency in this message is going to be one of the strongest points that we can attend to. Every single pastor on our staff, every single deacon on our deacon ministry, and every single uh, man that is on our financial steward team is a faithful tither above or beyond that. My wife and I, we've been praying, and God's called us, and it's between she and I where we could zero in and pay some debt off. This year, we will give 50% of our income back into the ministry. Now, I don't tell you that for you to step back and go, wow, that's amazing. I want you to understand that it's something that God deals with me personally on. And every single time, we begin to see him take us to a different place and a different level. And again, I want to offer this disclaimer that as a pastor, of this church and as a gospel minister, God has called me and you have entrusted me to preach the entirety of this book, the whole counsel of the Word of God. And that if any of these moments that I take a step back and go, whoa, whoa, whoa I can't talk about sex in church because that's just too sensitive. Although we could stu do an entire study on the Song of Solomon because it's a biblical mandate. Or if we talk about money as we'll do today, or if we talk about uh, suicide, or if we talk about pornography addiction or pride or anything, that if God calls us to do that, I think that's what you and I should expect from this stage is that we should do exactly what God has called us to do in this season. It's my goal today to perhaps undo some of these stringent mishaps of what has been spoken over our churches and our culture today with context of what God says about money and finances and mammon. I believe with all of my heart today that today is going to be a moment that just like the last few weeks that you're going to be set free in an area of understanding. It's, it's the lack of knowledge that people perish. The lack of vision. And today I pray in the name of Jesus that I give you the proper understanding from a biblical model that I pray that you would open your heart up today to hear what it is God has to say to you in this area. So I want you, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. You heard Doug refer to that. I want to say again, thank you so much to our This Is My Story participants, Doug and Starla Riddick this week. Doug is a, uh, one of our deacons. He's over our deacon ministry, and he's also a chairperson over our deacon ministry, but he is also our CFO, our chief financial officer. And Doug, unknowingly, several years ago, when I first met him, began to challenge me and Stephanie and I to, to do better in the area of our giving sacrificially because there was a principle behind that, as I'm going to share with you. And I followed that pattern throughout our life, giving sacrificially and watching God bless us in a way to open up the opportunity for us to give even more. Malachi chapter 3, if you're in your Bibles looking for it, it is the last book of the Old Testament. If you have an Italian influence, you can call it Malachi, I have no problem with that. But you'll go to Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament, hang a left, and there he is. Malachi is a prophet, 
that was the last one that God spoke through before he brought us the dispensation of grace or the cross, Jesus, crucified, resurrected. Series of silence entered into the equation of inspiration of God to man to pen the words of God from Malachi all the way up into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want you to understand the context here, and I would be doing this, this text a disservice if I didn't tell you that this is in the context of speaking to the children of Israel. But there is a principle that I'm going to prove to you here in this text that, that applies blanketly even to the church today. That in fact, if we're real honest, and I say this on Wednesday night all the time, here's a shameless plug. If you want to come to Wednesday night and really get into the Word, I'd love to have you come in here with us. It's 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. Pastor David over there with the youth at 645, children, so forth and so on. We'd love to have you. But what we understand is this, that, that if God says it in His Word, the entirety of the 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, that we realize that there is an application, that God is a changeless God. In fact, we're going to see that in the onset of Malachi chapter 3. That we can grab on to this truth today, and God's going to do something profound. Let me read on, if I may, in verses 6 through 10. He says, For I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Who is Jacob? He was one of the, one of the sons who birthed forth. His name was changed to Israel. He birthed forth the sons, the nations, the tribes of Israel. So he's speaking to Israel and he says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, and you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Not a rhetorical question. Directly asked of God. What's what he says. Yet you have robbed me, God says. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. Those are strong words, guys. We can't avoid that in Scripture. That if there's something that says there's a place for us to rob God, and when it's unbeknownst to us, we need to talk about it. There's an area where we can be cursed, and then there's sin that, that evolves around certain acts or lack thereof it. We need to talk about it. And he says this, For you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation, nation of Israel, bring all your tithes into the storehouse. The word storehouse is the Hebrew word otza, which literally means treasury. The treasury or the storehouse would have been found at the entranceway to the temple in the Old Testament. And we find that to be somewhat a, a, of a metaphor in the New Testament. We have a place where you walk in. Some churches do. Some churches no longer take up offering. We do that because we want to allow you the intentionality of giving and, and giving out of the a goodness and the abundance of your own heart, not grudgingly. Here's what I say all the time, and Pastor David reminded me of this this morning. If you, when that plate passes you, and you have to forcefully, you know that forcefully go in your, you know, like when you're going to buy your buddy lunch, but you really know you bought it last time. But like if you're going in here and you're like getting in your wallet and you're like, oh, I really don't want to do this, put it away. Because God already sees your heart. The church today, my friend, I'm glad to report to you is not broke. God's economy, God's kingdom is not broke. God is doing well. He owns it all. But watch this. He says that even this whole nation bringing the tithes into the storehouse and to the ox and to the treasury. Watch what he says. That there may be food in my house. And here's what he says that he never says again and never has said before. Because in fact he rebuked the enemy, Satan, Jesus did when he said, You shall not try the Lord thy God in any kind of way. Watch what he says. I want you to try me now in this, God said. Try me, prove me, says the Lord of hosts. And watch what he says. And see if I will not open up. For you, the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such a blessing that there not be room to receive it. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray today that you would help me to rightly divide this word of truth, to do so in a matter of confidence in who you are as we cover these problematic, difficult, even taboo subjects over these last few weeks and the weeks to come. Help us to do so with the power of the Holy Spirit that you would appropriate it according to the hearers as you see fit in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. I love that last word. There's going to be not enough room for you to receive it. I wonder in the house today, is there anybody who has any more room for a blessing in their life? I sure do. When is there anybody in the room that has any more room for a divine appointment in your life? I sure do. 
Is there anyone that has any more room in their life for, for the kids to act right, for the marriage to work, for, for things to just fall in its place? That is God's desire for you today. See, some of the ladies in here going, praise the Lord, hallelujah. You hit the nail on the head. Bless my marriage, oh God. But here's what I want you to know today, that he's not talking about this idea of giving to get those things. It's just simply a principle. I've said this many, many times. If I were to take this and drop it on the ground, it's going to hit. It's a matter of the law of gravity. The principles of God, the words of God are yes and amen in him. So today, I pray that you would understand this as we jump into this today. Let me give you a couple of things into what he's saying in this text and what he wants from me and you. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, this is what God desires for you today. Go ahead and tell him that. I want to bring you a message titled today, Turning My Life on a Dime. Turning My Life on a Dime. Number one, real quickly, if I'm going to lay a few of these different perspectives out. Number one, God lays a framework. God expects us to be a giver. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, he said, you have gone away from my ordinances and you have not kept them. Return to me, come back to my ordinances, come back to my principles, and I will return to you. He's speaking about fellowship. He's speaking about blessing. That's what we desire in our life. The picture of the children of Israel crossing over the River Jordan was not a picture of them entering into heaven, but entering into a place of fullness of fellowship and blessing. The land flowing with milk and honey wasn't about physical milk and honey flowing through the land in the form of a river. It was speaking of that sweet spot that we each want and desire to be in God's economy. That when I pray, I know that I'm connecting with Him. And that when I finish praying, I don't just arbitrarily get up, but that I wait and allow the, the Holy One to speak into my life. That fullness of open door, both going and coming, that's what we desire. And that comes in this framework. Watch what he says. He says, He is a changeless God. It is impossible. We're speaking to the attribute of God's immutability. It is impossible for God to change. Therein opens the door for us in theological discussions to adopt this principle called law of first mention. That any time God does something in Scripture the first time, if it be a theological truth, that we can literally grab onto that, unless he tells us otherwise, that it not be normative, we can grab onto that and realize that God being changeless is going to follow that suit throughout the entirety of Scripture, throughout the entirety of time. That the fact today, watch this, that he's not changeless allows me to grab onto something that is real, that is tangible, that I don't have to think about, I just simply do it. He sets forth the ordinances in the form of covenants. Now, all throughout, I'm not going to belabor this and get into all the covenants, but you've got to understand, agreements in the context of Scripture are called ordinances. They're binding. Some are unilateral. That means it's God and God only to man. It's unconditional. What do you mean, Mark? I mean like in the Noahic or Noah's covenant. God made a covenant with man that he would never again destroy the earth by way of water. That is an unconditional, unilateral covenant. He made it to man. Man has nothing to do with it. The Davidic covenant. He told him, he said, there is going to be one, a Messiah, that will come out of the root of David. That's unilateral. And it's, watch this, it's unconditional. It's coming that way. And man could not fool that plan if he wanted to. And I could go on and on. But there also are these bilateral, two people, party agreements, God and us. And there are conditional ones. There are some that has conditions. I submit to you that even salvation carries that weight of condition, doesn't it? Why? God has already died. He's already paid the penalty of sin. He's already got up. He's already defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's already separated the, the sin of man as far as the east is from the west. But watch this. But whosoever will come, you and I have a response we have to do. Whosoever shall confess his sin, believe in his heart, the Lord Jesus, if we call on his name, then we can be saved. There's a condition to that. It's there on God's part, but we have to receive it. Guys, tithing and offering is the same context. It's something that God has said, look, a tenth of your money, one tenth, the word tenth, uh, tithe means one tenth. It's a portion of the whole. And he says, if you set it apart because the tenth is holy unto God, it's, it's already sanctified. Whether you and I agree with that or not, God established that truth. And as he sets it apart, it's holy. And then finally, in this context of God laying the framework, comes the old question of, oh, but Mark, wasn't 
tithing really an Old Testament principle? I think we've all asked that. I have. And I will tell you that yes and no. Because if you go back into Genesis chapter 4, you will find the first theological point of reference that we ever see this idea of giving a tithe, a portion of first fruits over to God. And we see it in the, in the form of Cain and Abel. Listen to what it says. You don't have to turn there. Genesis chapter 4, 3 and 7. Listen to what it says. When it was time for the harvest. That's the reception of you and I having now been able to receive that which was planted. Cain presented some. Everybody say some. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel, his brother, also brought a gift. The best portion. Everybody say best. The best portion of his firstborn of his lambs. Firstborn. God did not want, and this went all throughout the New Old Testament. God did not want man's leftovers. He didn't want the crippled lambs. He didn't want the ones that were spotted. He didn't want the ones that you couldn't eat that were diseased. He wanted man's best because he gave us his best. God's a giver from the framing of the world. Do you know that if you go back into Genesis' account of creation, even before Genesis chapter 4, what we're talking about here, when God created, he created the fullness of the world, and he created all for man to enjoy, and even said man can subdue it. For all you hunters out there, that's where we park, right there, subdue it. When we hunt Bambi, we subduing her. But we get to name the animals. We get to do all of these things. That was God's plan. But he withheld but one thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He withheld a portion. He said, man, don't touch it. And man wanted to then and wants to today, wants to grab onto everything because the enemy says, well, surely God wouldn't withhold from you. God wants you. He's just afraid you're going to be like him. Guys, we've been living that problem ever since. But you see the gift that God gives us. And watch what he says. He says, and Cain presented some of the crops of the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portion, the firstborn of the lamb of his flock. Watch this. This is God's words. The Lord accepted Abel, but he did not accept Cain's gift. Both gave a gift. goes back to what I said a moment ago. If ever you think you're doing, you and I, doing God a favor by reaching in and throwing in a, a money in the plate and think, hey, we're cool. Guys, if you gave it grudgingly out of your heart and you didn't give it out of the right framework and you're just throwing God your leftovers, can I tell you something? Put it away. That's not how God works. God wants your best. I even jokingly laugh at this sometimes when I've, when I've taught on this before in a teaching environment. People say, you mean really God wants 10%? No, God wants 100%. He wants all of your life. He wants all of your marriage. He wants you to, to take and consecrate all of your finances over to Him, but only trust Him with giving that which is His. Hey, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. It even makes sense in the context of the government. We give a portion over to Uncle Sam. I assure you give that. If you don't, I mean, you're going to be praying as you start a prison ministry very shortly. It's coming around. But watch this. It says, this made Cain angry, and he looked dejected. Listen to God's response. Why are you so angry, God asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Talking in the area of his giving. Watch what he says. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Can I tell you something, guys? In one sentence, I can sum it all up right here. It's really not a matter of you having to give anything. It's the willingness to say, God, it's already yours. I give it willingly, asking you to bless it. Because that one-tenth, tenth means that it's representative of the whole. God could very well say, I want you to give me everything. And we could live in a country, bless God, that we have to give over to the government everything we make. And they determine how. We are a blessed people. But God is saying, don't allow this thing, money, to rule over you. You need to subdue it and master over it. Isn't it interesting that we find these words written within the first four book chapters of the, of the Word of God? Because it's important to God. Oh, and by the way, this is before the law was ever instituted in the book of Exodus. Some 490 or so years before. What about in Genesis chapter 14, before the law? Abraham, which was God's man, the father, if you will, of the entire nation. But also we today grafted into his promise of land, seed, and blessing. 
Abraham was God's man who found his faith to make him right with God. God saw that and saw it as counted it unto him as righteousness because he was a faith man. And we even find way before the law, we find that in Genesis chapter 14, 18 through 20, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine to the priest of the Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. Again, pre-law. It's before the law. This is God's heart. God is a giver. And he's given us the fullness of the world, the fullness of hope, the fullness of blessing from the very beginning. But not only do we see his initial mandate, we see God rebuking the non-giver. He says, but you said in Malachi 3, he says, in what way shall we return? Will the man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But I say, in what way have I robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Jesus, even in the New Testament, rebukes people openly in two distinct, very important places in the context of giving. In the first case he did, we find this in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And we find him in this saying in Matthew 6, 24, where it's written. He says, no one can serve two masters. I think that's something we would all agree on, wouldn't we? Because James says, if we have a divided allegiance, if we over here say we love God, but we're talking filthy, then that's, there's a contrast. If we say we love God, but we hate his people, according to 1 John, he says, you're a liar. It shows a divided allegiance. Hey, let's put it down here where we live. If you say you're a, 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 a dog fan, go dogs. Woo. If you say you're a dog fan, but you constantly go into your season pass holder to Auburn, which I don't even understand why you would do that, you have a divided allegiance. It doesn't make sense. You're saying one thing and doing another. Watch what he's saying. He says no man can serve two masters. Masters meaning something that, will, uh, that you allow to rule over you. You can have two masters. That's what he says. For either, listen to the language here, either he will hate the one and he will love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And then listen to this last little caveat within this text of Matthew. Man cannot serve both God and money. Jesus speaking to his people. Because he found then to be true, as is evident today, that we're allowing things in this world to rule over us, which puts us subservient to that thing. When the Bible has said it very clear, you know what you should owe in life today? You know what your debt should be? Owe no man nothing but to love him. What would the world, what would your home look like if you owed nothing to a person at all but to love him? It'd be amazing. What would our country look like if we didn't owe trillions of dollars to China it would be amazing what would the church look like today if she owed no man nothing but to love him it'd be amazing she can't serve two masters that was one of the greatest rebukes he made and then speaking a little more directly he spoke of a person inheriting the kingdom of God salvation and he begins to speak in the Gospels again in Luke, and he says, Hey, you see this rich man over here? This rich man is going to have a difficult time going to heaven. This just blew out of the water everything that had been taught. Why? Because the Pharisees of the day, the, the self-righteous, were some of the wealthiest people in the church. You know what they taught? They taught that if, that if you're right with God through us, you're going to be wealthy. Can I tell you, people are still preaching that lie. Some people I know today are some of the most wealthy people in the world, and they're miserable because they don't have peace with God. I've often had people say, well, when, when is God going to bless me? When, is God, when you stop asking that question. The point of reference in our giving, and I can only speak for Stephanie and I, is not that we're giving it so we can say, hey, God, hook a brother up or walk outside the church with hands open wide. We're doing so saying, God, thank you for giving us what you have given. Let us be a blessing into the kingdom. Oh, and by the way, the default to that is he keeps blessing. So we keep giving. And I'm gonna, listen, how many of you, what I just said, you've already tested God and you've seen that to be true in your own life? Y'all look around, wave your hand up. Come on. It's evident. 
And I know, I get the taboo statements and the, you know, they, they want this, they want that. But let me tell you something. We're doing what God has called us to do. And listen to what he said in the context of salvation. Whatever verbiage you want to use. He said this, it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. He wasn't talking about a man that just had money. There's nothing wrong with having money. Bless God, if you got it, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Be faithful with it. Maybe you're just a great business person. Maybe God's just blessed you because of your father or your mother. Or maybe, or maybe you're just out there on the grind, man. But let me tell you something, my friend, and be cautious of this. When you allow that thing to rule over you, you are on a road leading to destruction. I love what Stephanie said to me many, many years ago, and we've always tithed. Uh, sometimes in, early in my Christianity, I, I, I thought so very grudgingly. I thought, I don't, don't want to tithe. We can't afford to. We'd sit down in our checkbook and go, well, we got to pay this, got to pay this, got to pay this. Now, how are we going to have money left over? She said, no, we write this one first. We let everything else fall in place. We don't want to be a reservoir, guys, just receiving blessing. We want to be a channel allowing God to use us as a conduit to reach the lost and dying world. What was he saying when he said this about the eye of the needle? There was a needle gate, according to historians, a needle gate would have been one of the gates outside the city walls. It would have been the smaller of the gates that would have been used at dark and after dark time, nighttime, for the purposes of security and safety. And what he could have been saying, we don't know, I know he was speaking in a, in a basically this illustration, this hyperbole, he was using an exaggerated metaphor to help us understand it's impossible. But there was a gate there that a camel certainly would not have walked through. So what they would have to do is they'd have to take all the baggage and all the saddles and all the stuff off of this very large animal, have him kneel down and squeeze through. That's, that's one food for thought. Maybe that's what he was talking about. Maybe that's historical. Could it have been physically, literally, a, 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 it would have been as impossible as a camel walking through the eye of a needle. There's other thoughts that it was perhaps uh, a cable or a rope going through. In which case, it doesn't matter. The, it, the, the end of all ends is it would have been impossible for a rich man who had an allegiance to wealth and the control of money and mammon and that had become his master. It would be impossible for him to go to heaven. So the, so, the, so the finality of that question came from the disciples and they said, well, who can go? It seems impossible with man. And he said, yes, but it's possible with God. Two direct rebukes. And then we see in the finality of this, God issues us the challenge. It's a challenge of faith. Listen to what he says in Malachi chapter 3. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and now try me in this. You've got to understand when this was written and all throughout the Old Testament, it was a system of bartering. Very, very uncommon for men to possess money in the exchange the way we do today. Still cultures that exist today in, in, in our planet that actually still operate on the barter system. I, I raise a few goats and I go exchange that for something else. And even, in fact, in the Old Testament and even still in the Middle Eastern cultures today, that's even the way that a, that a young groom-to-be would have purchased his bride-to-be. He would have went to the father, and he would purchase her perhaps with 15 sheep and 12 goats, and, and which doesn't sound very romantic. And you just hope that you're not that girl that the guy goes and purchases your daughter, and he goes, I'll give you a dog. I mean, you know, I just hate that that would happen. Give you one pig for her. Come on, work with me. But in either case, the reality was that there had to be an exchange for something. So even if you go back into Genesis in the context of what we would think a storehouse would have looked like, a place to hold grain, even in Joseph's, Joseph's day, you would have realized, watch what happened, that they would take in a time of plenty, in a time of income, and they would take it to the central location in the town, and they would offer it up so that it could be put away and stored, set apart, sanctified, if you will, for the betterment of the whole, so that if their time came with a time of famine, there would be a disbursement of those goods so that everyone could profit. Guys, that's what it looks like in a church. When we come in, you're not tithing to pay the bill on the building. You're not tithing to pay the salaries. You're not tithing to do this or that. You're tithing because it's God's heart. It's God's mandate. It's what He has called holy. 
And watch this. When we do that, he does those other things. But guys, we send out and we get to be a blessing to others so that the gospel of Jesus Christ be magnified. That's our heart. Not that it just goes forth in these walls, but that it goes out. God even elaborates in this idea of don't be deceived for a man can't sow one thing and harvest something completely different. Guys, I want you to hear my heart here today. I really do. That if we sow according to Scripture sparingly, we will reap sparingly. If I go down here on the back side of this property and I sow one acre of corn, there's a real good chance that I'm not going to reap 100 acres of corn harvest. That makes no sense. I should be expecting a proportionate harvest based on the proportionate seed that I've sown. Amen? But if I sow bountifully into the kingdom of God, then I can expect to reap bountifully. Not as the whole premise of why I give, but as just an expectation of who God is. And then we see this last concrete principle. God applies this area of His gracious giving. His giving. God's a giver. He says, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I'm not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that there will not be enough room to receive it. Blessing. From the very framework of the world, God has been a giver. Advance him all the way through the Old Testament when man failed. God was a giver. He gave his holy word, he gave his sacraments, he gave his ordinances, he gave his covenants some of which had nothing to do with you and I. They were unconditional, unilateral. God's going to bless just because God's a giver. But I submit to you the most evident picture of the graceful giving of God to mankind was when he stepped out of eternity and into time. He stepped out of glory and into humanity. He stepped out of the majesty and into a manger in the form of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave. His only son. He didn't just give his best. He gave his only one. In short, he has held nothing back from me and you. Why do we walk through life so afraid of giving God our best? God doesn't want your leftovers, man. He wants your best. God doesn't need your tips. He wants your best. I get it. I totally understand. I've sit where maybe some of you are sitting today, but I've had more questions that has raised this urgency of explanation to know that a tithe is one tenth. It is holy unto God. It's a picture of divine order. It is based on the ordinance of Him giving and us giving Him what is already His. Why does He say a tenth? I don't know. That's God's business. And that above that is an offering, a sacrificial. It's something that we want to do. I can't tell you how blessed I've been from people in this room that has been just givers, man, to me. And I'm not talking financially. I'm talking about giving me their heart, man, giving me counsel, giving me just a, a, a love and a support. That, that's also part of this story here, that we give a portion of ourselves back over to God in service. You'll hear all the time, volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. And we're, why do I volunteer? I'm busy. Giving over your time to God. It's, I know it's hard. Do you realize there are people that cannot come in here week in and week out because they're giving to your children? They're givers. Because God has given them a talent and a calling. And they do so sacrificially. But if you get nothing else out of this very simple, very poignant, point in reference here today, I want you to grab onto this truth. What if? What if you're missing something profound based on the context of God's ordinance and His principle and His own giving? What if you're missing one of the greatest levels of blessing in your life because you're holding back a portion of who you are? 
what would it look like if the entire church at large was just merely a tither? There would be no end to what we could do. No end. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me for just a moment. You're sitting there today and maybe you're just thinking about this word that has gone forth and maybe just something bigger is connecting in your heart and that is in the context of your ability to receive. The Bible says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become a son of God. Did you hear that? Just receive the gift that he's already given. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I call upon him today? Or I don't fear that I'm so dirty and so filthy. Let me tell you something. Today is the day of salvation. This is your moment. Call upon his name right now. Say, dear Jesus, pray this prayer of faith right now from your heart to God. And by grace, through faith in him, not a magical prayer of words, but just in the faith of his word. Say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have failed you. But today, I ask you to heal my broken heart. Save me. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to live for you until the day you call me home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you pray that today in faith, I would sure like to know it, to pray for you. I'm not going to come to you, point you out, but I'd like to know it. If you prayed and invited Jesus in your heart today, lift your hand right now. Lift it up high. Sir, ma'am, God bless you. God bless you. I see several hands over here on the left. How about on the right? God bless you, ma'am. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? Just I pray today and invite a Jesus in my heart. I don't have it all figured out, but today I know that I'm a child of the Most High God. Lift your hand right now. God bless you. I see another hand. Anyone else? Several hands have gone up. How about the rest of you? Today, Mark, I want to give God my best. I want to align myself not with your words, not with your teachings, but with God's word and his teachings and his mandates and his promises and his covenants. That's me today, Mark. I want to get there. I'm not there yet. But I want to get there. Maybe it's in the area of your giving. Maybe it's in the area of your service. Maybe it's in the area of your faith. Maybe it's in the area of your forgiveness. But I want to get there. Would you pray for me? Lift your hand right now. There should be hands all over the room. I want to be there. I want to get there. I want to serve. I want to be there. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. Everyone's standing right now. Everyone's standing in the house. I'm going to stand down front. If God has saved you today, we've got some people that love to pray for you. If he's redeemed you, but I ask you not to leave because I'm going to share something with you right after the service today. i got something I want to share with you. It's very important for you to know. So this is a very sacred moment. People are making decisions. Maybe your kids, you're struggling. Maybe you're struggling with a financial situation. Maybe you're struggling in your relationship. Maybe you're struggling in your faith. Whatever it may be, today is the day that you change it all on a dime. Maybe it's in the area of your giving and you just want to walk in faith and do what God's called you to do. Whatever it may be, this altar is open. The doors of our church stand open for you to come and to be a part of Northridge Church. If you'd like to do that, we'd just love for you to come today. If you just want to come for a time of prayer. While they sing, you come. I'm going to stand down front. If God has spoken to you in some way, just want to come shake no my hand. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Then here in your love, here in your love, no place I'd rather be, no place I'd rather be, no place I'd rather be, than here in your love, here in your love. No place. No place I'd arrive.